The many faces of Dr. Mastermind. Are we having fun yet? So, while I lived at uh, the Country Pines Apartments, this friend of mine, Jerry Gookin, had a band, and uh, I would go buy stuff from him. And they practiced down the street. They're all Southeast kids, but they practiced in Beaverton, this suburb. So I went over to jam with them and um, Rick Boltina, and we played on this cable access show with no preparation, and uh, that was fun. I made the songs up on the spot while we were playing them on TV. Ailey and Cyril Christian, a talk of Craig Knight, neighbor of the Mather Brothers, and a special moment with an unnamed guest. So now let's hear from our band, Mastermind. Dotson boy, Tom Peranto, he was a guitar player in Portland's first death metal band, Bludgeon. And uh, he's Joe Bloomstone's pal. I've known him forever. Great guy. I love Tom. Always says it's a Christmas card. My mom loves Tom. And uh, so he was in my band, and uh, Mark Laskowski had this warehouse downtown, the Hoyt Towers, before they became the Hoyt Towers. And so we joined up with him, and we did the Metal Madness Metal Fest at the Starry Night, and Larry Hurwitz was gonna, he's going for a record, gonna go 24 hours and have as many bands as he could. 20 bands, it's never been done before. Maybe somebody should drop a postcard to the Guinness of records and albums and tapes. Here's the Doctor Mastermind. <laughs>
we played the Moosehead, and we played some big shows like the Pine Street Theater. Kip was the guitar player. You'll notice that Kip Doran is kind of a continuous guy throughout my life, and he was one of my best friends and the great guitar player. So we, uh, Mike Alberson was playing bass, and I was playing the other guitar, and Kip was on guitar, and Scott Spencer was on drums, and sometimes Dean would show up. And when Dean would show up, we would become Mrs. Beasley's Nightmare and play Dr. Mastermind and Wild Dogs, and I would sing. John Donnelly would play bass, and um, that was fun. You know, it was great to have Dean come up and... Um, because one night I was playing drums, and the drummer was not available, Scott. So I had to play my crappy little single and drum set, and my butt hurt. And I said, Dean, does it matter what kind of drum throne you use? And he said, oh, yeah, bro, that's your most important part. Your ass is going to hurt. And he was right. But uh, we played to nobody.
bunch of stuff. Oh, yeah, 1995. Somehow I hooked up with uh, these two women from the band called the Voodoo Dolls and uh, Janine and uh, Leslie. And we had Merle, Merle Hale on drums. We had Paul Dreher on drums. And, uh, you know, that was like kind of like a motorhead, kind of a punk thing. I played guitar. And Janine had this awesome L6S, and I would play. And we played with uh, Kurt Vanderhoof's band Hall of Flame at the, the Roseland, the Starry Night. That was 1995, right before I went to school. And after I went to school, I just didn't play much. I was too busy going to school. <laughs> forward to school I went to PCC Portland Community College and uh, did video intern so that would teach you how to work in a control room like in a like that led to all kinds of film work and uh, I did all these bumpers he said go volunteer on this and you'll get some work and I did and uh, Mark how no what was his name Dave uh, anyway I started working in movies like you know just another fluke and one of the movies Michael Murphy and, um, God, I can't remember his name. He's another dead guy. You know, all my friends are dead, just like the book. It was called Out of the Wilderness. It was actually called Black Feather when we started working on it. It was about a raven, kind of a Disney movie. This raven had helped this woman, this girl. This little girl got crushed by a tree in Alaska and got her dad to go find the girl and get her out of the tree, and she was paralyzed from the waist down after that and the bird became her friend and David Carradine was in it and Peter Jason and Peter Jason was the guy in the cowboy bar in 48 hours who told Eddie Murphy well you want a black Russian he also was a guy in Escape from New York Escape from LA that was it he's been he's a character actor has been in a million things and uh David Naughton was the American werewolf in London also the Dr. Pepper guy I worked on that film. They liked me really well, so they wrote a part for me as a morning talk show radio host because the bird was on trial for finding all of these stolen jewelry and stuff. It's, you know, kind of a dorky movie. A lot of it was shot in Alaska. The rest of it was shot in Portland, mainly at the synagogue uh, 
can't remember the name of it. It was uh, Elizabeth or something. The one, the synagogue down in Northwest. That was a great experience. Let's take a look at my scene from Out of the Wilderness. It's been on HBO, Showtime, Cinemax, and I bought the uh, VHS copy from Albertson's throwout bin, and then I bought this DVD version in their toss-out bin when they were going out of business. So it's uh, been around. <laughs> And uh, I couldn't work on the film because it was a SAG film, so I had to wait till the thing was done. So I do a voiceover, but it's still a credited part and stuff. Kind of cool. Hit it. Matt McCord on FM 94, KJOX. It's another glorious sunny day in the Rose City. We're waiting and watching with the rest of the nation and all its animals for today's controversial raven hearing at the Department of the Interior. Millionaire buckskin lawyer Clint Dugan is in town to defend animal rights and the little girl Melissa, whose pet bird Blackfeather has been held by the feds for mischievous conduct. Now that's a real jailbird for you. Judge Battle has ordered a media blackout, but our inside sources will keep us posted. Hey, that's our topic. Do we have a caller? Caller, you're on the air with a Mad Matt in the morning. I don't get it. Spotted owls, ravens. Hey, why don't they stay in the woods where they belong? Why waste our time and money on these loony animals that don't belong in our backyards? Right. Maybe we need public enemies. <laughs> Might as well go after the bears, cougars, and ravens that can't defend themselves. Next caller, you're on line three. This is from 1993. This is another reunion gig at the Starry Night, and it was around Matt's birthday, and John Donnelly and Dane Peterson, both who are dead now, like everyone else, got him just tanked up on Jagermeister. And, uh, well, here, let's take a look.
By 1989, all the metal stuff was pretty much over. It was done. The bands that were going to last had already made their mark, and they were going to go on, and pretty much everybody else was going to go do landscaping, painting, and whatever else, because, you know, the dream was never really there, but for a few. And uh, I had my warehouse in 1989, and Vinny Swine, my Ravers bandmate, he was going to move to Seattle right before this, or he'd been up there visiting, and he said, uh, hey, there's a new thing that's going to happen. It's going to be grunge, and uh, there's a band called Soundgarden that's going to play at Music Millennium, Terry Courier's record store, huge record store. He had a couple of locations. And that was just, you know, five minutes away from my place. So he said, let's go over and watch Soundgarden perform at Music Millennium. And I said, okay. And he kept saying jokes about the Garden of Sound. And we went there. I had no idea what to expect. But got there, and the cover of Louder Than Love was everywhere. They were doing an in-store promotion for this record. I had no idea who this band was. I just remember we went there, and that band was so fucking good. It was great. And I thought, oh, man, these guys don't have costumes. These guys are regular people. Everybody can relate to this. And they sound like they've been listening to all the greatest bands that weren't gimmicky all along the way. And uh, that singer was amazing. And good-looking guy and long hair and I thought this is the future and it's gonna knock the heavy metal right out of the ballpark and it did along with Alice in Chains and Pearl Jam and Nirvana and then later on Stone Temple Pilots from down south uh, I mean they made real music instead of like uh, what I always think of heavy metal is like candy then uh, later the 80s got the more candy store it got like prepackaged crap with guys in fringe jackets. And I thought it was kind of dumb by the end of the night, but mid 80s, I mean, I'm one of those guys who had a costume, but I was actually just pretending I was Gene Simmons from Early Kiss. <laughs> so <laughs> that goes on. And I also was working at this Captain Beans coffee place in Clackamas Town Center. And uh, Tombstone Music was just right past that, so I'd stop there all the time and see Fred and Tootie and buy guitar. And that's how I got back into playing music after the warehouse. I uh, started a blues band, a, like a heavy metal blues band called the East Side Stranglers. And I had uh, Mike Alberson on bass and uh, Scott Spencer on uh, drums, who you saw with the one mastermind thing on the cable access in one of the last episodes and uh, Kip Doran on guitar and me on guitar. And, uh, well, let's take a look at this video from the East Side Stranglers at the Pine Street Theater. It's a little dark. Buko took the video. He always had a video camera in his hand and Kip still needs to do more leads. That's an inside joke because he'd go interview people and say, do you think Kip needs to do more leads? So here we go. East Side Stranglers from 1992.
camera outside. Go, go, go out and catch Dean and get him from the parking spot. Yeah. So, like I said, metal was pretty much dead in the early 90s and, and pretty much for the whole 90s. And uh, I played in a cover band for a little while with uh, Jeff and Al Seahorn, which just was a horrible experience because I wasn't drinking and uh, it was all about drinking. And I don't like being in bars. And uh, so I quit doing that and wasn't doing anything for a while. We were doing cable access all the time, and Debbie said, why don't you go to PCC, Portland Community College, and have a great video program. And the people at cable access told me, if you want to get a real training, Portland Community College has a great program. Debbie was going there and hooked me up with how to fill out the forms for financial aid. And I went to PCC and learned how to do video and film production righteously, which got me good money, good paying jobs after I was out of the, the course. But uh, my final project was Mad Magazine, The Lighter Side Of, which I directed. I acted in one of the skits, and uh, Wendy Young was a producer and got us all this free food. She was great. We'd show up, and these gourmet pizza guys would be delivering, like, you know, six pieces, pizzas, and there was only, like, you know, six of us, three people in my class. So I, uh, well, let's take a look at... The Lighter Side Of from Mad Magazine. I had to hook up with Dick DiBartolo from Mad Magazine, and they sent me all this great stuff, books and signed autograph things, and you know, because I've been a huge Mad Magazine fan since I was five. I learned to read from that magazine. That and the uh, Playboy Centerfold jokes. <laughs> yep, I was a guy who read articles. <laughs> but uh, let's take a look at this. This is Mad Magazine, 1995, The Lighter Side. Hello, I'm John Hannum. You may not know me, but I spend most of my life discovering the galaxy's most strange and bizarre life forms. After a near-death experience, I returned to planet Earth and acquired WAIM Productions. As you may know, 
WM Production has been involved in some of the most strange and bizarre yet sordid documentaries known to man. Tonight is no exception. Join me now as we enter into Mad Magazine's A Lighter Side. You know why I stopped you? Uh, no. Well, the speed limit's 20 miles an hour. You're doing at least 50. Oh, heck, I was doing at least 75. Uh, excuse me, officer. You can't believe a word this man says. Why not? Because he always exaggerates when he's drunk. You been drinking, sir? <clears throat> uh, yeah. Phone, you'll come out here, you'll take care of your friends who've come over and waited all day, and everything is gonna be fine and dandy, right? I promise. I love you, Sudoku. You promise? I promise. I've got a surprise for you. Don't go away. Oh, man. I know. I'm very lucky. I think he's got a present for me. I think it's the cordless phone I've been wanting. Oh, we'll just see. We'll see. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, wait, here it goes. Here it comes. All right. Oh, bye. Hi, honey. I got something for you. A present? Yeah, betcha. Really? Can you guess what it is? A cordless phone? That's right. Honey, no. Oh. Here's your cordless oh. phone, honey. something for a bad case of the hiccups? I certainly do. Boo! Hey! What are you trying to do? Give me a heart attack? Your hiccups are gone, aren't they? It works every time. I was asking for my wife back oh. home! Mm-hmm. Five, four, three. 
God. I'm so sorry. I'm such a klutz. I messed up your old carpet. That's okay. I'll get a broom. I'll clean it up. Ah! Ah, no, no! Oh! Ah! 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 Jeff and I have been working for uh, this band called Johnny Limbo and the Lug Nuts. These guys. I booked them on, uh, it was right after I was out of school, so I was like, I had worked at one at Coin for a while and these other TV stations, and so I booked them on the, the uh, morning show on the ABC affiliate called AM Northwest to help promote a, a Christmas show that they did with Paul Revere and the Raiders uh, baseball. Four, two, Almost tasted 
out with a bunch of songs and I put them on various things and bonus tracks of things but uh, Pete Lofman had found me and at a gig when we were going to see Bryce Van Patten's group and we hooked up with Michael Brown who had been the Dr. Mastermind guitar player for a minute and we started playing we played a TV show cable access show and then we just took it further we just kept staying together as a band and got booked at the, the Starry Night, Double T's place, The Roseland by then, I'm sure. And we opened for Great White and Dawkin and Dio and Blue Oyster Cult. And uh, I forgot that was our home thing. That's like where all these videos came from. And uh, that's pretty much how I closed out the, the 90s. We did a show at the, uh, at the Roseland Theater, a uh, New Year's Eve show. That was it. It was going to be the 21st century, Y2K. Everything was supposed to stop. And uh, we're still here. <laughs> 